is Raj Srivastav. Uh, I direct the Center for Supply Chain Excellence, where we host a webinar series. And I'd love to welcome everyone who's on board here uh, to hear John. I just want a quick brief introduction of John. Uh, John Fisher is the Vice President for Business Development at Project 44. And beyond that, John does not need any introduction. Uh, uh, he is known to everyone in the world of supply chain, uh, students, academia, and industry alike. If you haven't met John, it's because your paths have not crossed yet. <laughs> and they soon will. Uh, so with that, John, I'm going to let you speak because I don't think I can do it justice to any introduction for you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for taking uh, some this valuable time out of your day to uh, join us here. And I hope I can uh, share some good uh, information with you. I want to thank Dr. Raj and uh, the Center of Supply Chain Excellence and Michelle for all their help in uh, putting this together. Um, so I'm going to try and share what's what I'm seeing today, my insights uh, to what's happening in real-time visibility. And I hope you get at least uh, one good idea out of this. Hi, Pete. Um, Good afternoon. Now that Pete's here, I was just going to say, I'm one of the co-founders of our supply chain forum of Southwest Florida with Pete Rosano of Arthrex, and uh, we've been supporting Dr. Raj and the uh, the program here. We're going to continue to. And just a plug for our next event, it's going to be November 10th uh, at Scott Lenz's new headquarters right off of 75 there. Uh, the theme is going to be women in logistics. It's going to be an in-person event, a half day from approximately 830 to noon or one. So we hope uh, those of you that uh, can make it, do make it. Let me uh, share my screen here. Apologize, I should have had that up and ready. So you already have my introduction. Pleasure to be here today. Let me move this up here. So I'm gonna be talking about the role of real-time visibility in managing disruptions to achieve supply chain resiliency. Uh, we could probably spend, I could anyway, three hours on this and divide these into various buckets. But uh, uh, I think the, um, the key thing we were talking earlier uh, when some were on early about, uh, you know, it's all about people, process, technology, and data. Uh, I'm not gonna be, I'm gonna assume that, uh, you know, we have the best people at all of our organizations and we have strong processes. So the focus today is gonna be on the data. But uh, why should you care? So if we were together at the live, I would say, how about a show of hands of those of you that- I'm gonna check. Hello. I'm gonna, I'm checking, checking. Uh, please the, do, listen, put yourself please on, do not put share. Put yourself on mute, please. Um, social security number, okay? Was she just a, yeah, was she just a walk-in? Uh, she just walk in that hey, Mich she Michelle? Be, Michelle, is there some way for you to mute everyone? So I apologize for that. Um, but if we were there live, I'd ask for a show of hands. How many are using Amazon? Who is that talking about? Frustrating. Wow. Just give me a minute. I'll, I'll call Michelle. Yeah, we need to mute whoever that is. So I apologize. Um, I started to say Nancy must have interviewed her. <laughs> Nancy. Kevin, she's applied a bunch of times. One, two, three. Give me a minute. Five times she's this. applied. Yeah. Anyway, I'm glad she showed up. Let me let me do a quick check. Okay. Uh, Shiva, could you put your mic on mute, please? What? I believe that's Shiva. Oh, don't. I understand, but you know, obviously. I understand because you know I just had the same situation with another store. They want to hire somebody, and she's oh she's great and everything. I go oh, like this. Shiva, so Shiva. much theft in the record. Is Shiva listening? I mean, I, because it's going to make your life hard. Just John, just scribble it on a piece of paper and hold it up. Uh, God, all right. So I started to say, I'm going to go ahead, folks. I apologize for this. I'm not controlling this. Uh, Michelle should be able to put him on mute. That's an 86. How old is she? Roughly. All right, folks. <laughs> I started to say again, third time. So how many use Amazon Prime, Uber Eats, 
Uber, Lyft, uh, DoorDash, Domino's, uh, et cetera. What do they all have in common? 30, 35. The common is it's real-time visibility. It's 35. And these are real-time updates. And this is real real-time visibility in action, but it's in a oh, B2C environment, it's not in the business to business now. environment. Now I ask you, what, what do you have in your own environment? She's okay. If we she had time to not. talk about this, uh, I think I'd find out and you would see that we're still operating in a uh, very outdated EDI batch. She's on the same one. She's not the same one from Excel spreadsheets, she... um, et cetera. I'm really wishing to get Stephen to shut up. Here, she was I'm very out. good and all. And then I spoke to Masood and he said she worked for two months. Did we, did we get him gone? <laughs> Everybody still hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, apologize. Yep. So uh, I'm not gonna talk about Project 44 today, but we are a leader in real-time visibility. So I hope that will at least uh, give you some idea and credibility that uh, what I'm gonna be talking about, I know what I'm talking about. Uh, when I started in this business, these are some of the tools that we used. <laughs> You'll find most of them in, in museums. Uh, they weren't real-time at all. Uh, you had delays of days in getting information, finding information, seeing information. And of course, that's all changed with all the new technology that exists now. And <clears throat> when I've been in this uh, transportation business a long time, both as a 3PL and then in technology, we've been talking about real-time visibility for 30 years. But now it's all about the data. Data is the new oil. And high fidelity data, real-time data, that is data that is accurate, complete, and timely, is really the foundation for everything that we're gonna be doing in supply chain. It's one of the reasons that technology has been built into the supply chain program at FGCU. So I say we have the perfect storm, uh, certainly the Amazon effect. We all expect to see it right now, see it on our phone um, and, and, and know where something is. There's new modern technology. Certainly APIs are replacing um, EDI everywhere. Uh, APIs have been used in finance forever. Uh, everything on your phone is an API. If you use Uber or Lyft, it's an API because it's immediate, it's two-way. You can see the car, you can, as we said, you can see them with the, making the Domino's pizza and when it's gonna get to you. Uh, another part of the perfect storm was the um, ELD, electronic logging device mandate in 2018, at least here in North America, that required the over-the-road truckers to provide uh, updated electronics so that we knew where the, where the truck was and how long the driver had been driving. This is part of the hours of service mandate. We're way behind Europe. Europe has been using telematics like that for years, but that was another part of this perfect storm. And then you have the internet of things and sensors that are being put into not only equipment, but onto uh, shipments, uh, co uh, certainly cold chain shipments for uh, medical, uh, certainly food and beverage. Uh, you know, we handle Starbucks, so uh, things like that. We handle AbbVie, which is uh, pharmaceuticals. So as you know, shelf life, uh, might be 72 hours, 96 hours, it depends. And then things like geofencing. So these all enable us to really have real-time visibility to the same level that we're talking about with Amazon Prime and Domino's and Uber Eats. Uh, and there's an overall digital transformation going on across companies to, to move from a manual environment and digitize processes and uh, allow their employees to do more analytics and more value-added activities versus uh, mundane work. COVID certainly exposed the flaws of the supply chains across the globe. People could not answer, where is my stuff? Certainly, you know that in the beginning when everybody was, uh, where's the toilet paper, where's the water? Uh, this became a, a crisis of sorts, right? Uh, and visibility kind of raised its, uh, its head. And uh, certainly I know for our company it was a, a tailwind because customers were calling us left and right that, hey, we need to have this visibility. We have no idea where anything is. You know, we're shutting down production lines, uh, we're missing uh, uh, deliveries to hospitals, uh, on and on and on. So supply chain is now cool, as we all know, those of us that are, everybody's talking about supply chain and five years ago that you had, it. what's supply chain? Well, that's changed. So I'm gonna cover how uh, real-time visibility data is foundational to achieving 
um, supply chain resiliency. And I'll show you some examples of how this data is used today and how it feeds other systems. Uh, there's no one system that does it all. We certainly don't. Just like on your laptop, you'll see Intel inside. That's kind of what we are. We're the plumbing getting this uh, real-time data to systems that need it, whether it's SAP or a TMS or an ERP. And I will give some examples of, of different systems as we uh, go forward. So the delivery expectations have, have changed. Uh, as we just talked about, we all expect something different because of what we're experiencing is when we're home. So when we go to the office, we don't want one of those old uh, dumb screens, uh, the AS400 type screens uh, that are, don't provide us any information. A cell phone gives you more. And then at the same time, uh, delivery constraints, we just talked about some with uh, Ian, uh, whether it's capacity uh, rates uh, and other problems uh, kind of really have a challenge for us. So in general, uh, communication across the transportation industry and the supply chain has been very fragmented and uh, very dysfunctional, honestly. Uh, many different parties involved. This is a simple diagram of a you know, domestic US shipment and all the different people that could be involved. And there's all sorts of legacy systems, manual processes, faxes, phone calls, operational works, uh, uh, Excel spreadsheets, none of which are aligned, none of which are in concert. Uh, and when you expand this globally, it's it's even uglier. And this is what's been driving uh, this whole focus on real-time visibility. Gartner, who are you know kind of the leaders and advising many companies, has said it's the most important thing you can invest in. Um, that is uh, real-time visibility uh, uh, for end-to-end -end supply chain, and it's been the most invested initiative that companies are investing in. I would say that it also impacts the items below inventory, asset uh, optimization, uh, analytics, supply chain network design. I and mean, we feed, I know we feed data to systems that do network uh, optimization and then customer supplier collaboration. So again, that's why I say the data is foundational back to people, process, technology, and data. As we said internationally, and many of you uh, deal internationally, certainly Arthrex uh, with operations uh, around the world, customers around the world, many different players are involved in these global supply chains, right? There's uh, suppliers and freight forwarders and carriers and customs brokers and non-governmental agencies. You can go on and on and on. And you can imagine uh, the complexity of bringing all that data together uh, versus maybe a shipment going from party A to party B from Florida to Atlanta. This is an example here of uh, Starbucks, one of our clients. I'll, I'll go through it quickly. We could probably spend an hour on it alone. But what we put together with them is a global system that goes all the way from the coffee growers around the world to the shipments that are moving out of anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world, to the roasting facilities, from the roasting facilities to the RDCs, from the RDCs to the stores, with also finished goods moving in from, <coughs> excuse me, different parts of the world. Get some water here. And visibility throughout that entire process, order and inventory visibility is one of the key things is you're not just tracking a shipment, are you? Or a container, you wanna know what is the purchase order or sales order? What are the SKU numbers, model numbers, part numbers that are in that shipment? And where are they and where do they need to be? It doesn't matter if it's moving ocean, or truck, or if you're trying to do slot booking is when you're booking appointments uh, to get into a dock door to get something delivered, which can be very problematic depending on the particular location. And then feeding that data to other systems, like planning systems, I believe this one might be uh, actually 09 Solutions, uh, who is then using that data to further plan real time on what's happening. A lot of these planning systems historically had used static data well, this is what we did historically. Could you imagine using historical data from 2019 without taking into effect what happened in 2020 or what's happening now? <laughs> it would be a nightmare. So in our case, and what, what we're seeing in the industry is this movement to API first. Uh, as we all know, people in transportation and supply chain are the last ones to ever get uh, you know, the latest and greatest. And uh, so API is coming to us many, many, many years after it's already been used in the financial world. Uh, but it allows for this two-way communication. Again, look at Uber and Lyft right on your phone. That's an API. We're just doing the same thing with cargo movements, with movements of inventory around the world. And when you look at that, 
you want to look at it from first mile to last mile. And this is just showing you, doesn't matter where it's going to or from, but there's many different modes and parties that could be touching the, uh, the inventory, the shipment as it's moving. And you need to have those real time updates, no matter where you're getting that information from, whether it's an ocean line, an airline, a port or terminal, a rail line, a truck, uh, you know, UPS, FedEx, even down the last mile couriers. Uh, as you know, there's even robotics now delivering things uh, and drones. Uh, we're working on a project in um, Africa with drones delivering to uh, hospitals and clinics in the middle of nowhere where, where roads have been washed out. And these drones will go out 100 uh, kilometers and actually in some cases drop a parachute with blood down to the hospital and return to base. I mean, it's amazing the things that are being done and can be done with this new technology. So at a high level, uh, we operate in the middle between the carriers around the world, if you look at the left side here, and then whoever the customer is and whatever systems they use. We don't care again if it's SAP or whatever, but we're going out to gather data from via APIs or Internet of Things or ELDs or other telematics and, and or apps. We have an app as well. We don't believe apps are sustainable uh, because a driver can turn it off and, uh, you know, uh, go to a bar and be gone a few hours and now you have no information on your shipment. So we want to rather be have machine to machine uh, interaction. With that, then we add uh, algorithms, machine learning, AI on weather, traffic, historical patterns to predict the ETA. And I'll show you some examples of when something is going to arrive, which is very important, obviously, uh, depending on the situation, whether it's manufacturing or uh, hospital situation or whatever it might be. So with this real-time visibility, what we've never been able to do before is to go upstream and see problems before they happen or as they happen that will impact downstream. So uh, what's happening right now in the ocean world is a lot of shipments are being rolled. That is, they miss the sailing. And uh, sometimes people don't find out for that, find out about that for a week or 10 days or whatever. Uh, with our technology and people like us with real-time visibility, we know if a container did not make a ship. So you now can start making alternative plans. You may have to fly some of it. You may have to charter. Uh, but the earlier you have information, the earlier warning system, the better that you can uh, provide information to your customer. Many of our furniture customers are using this to provide available to promise because if you've tried to order furniture lately or an appliance, you're probably getting a three to four month lead time. And so if uh, rooms to go or uh, uh, Haverty's or city furniture, somebody can say to their customer, hey, uh, I can tell you this will be here in two weeks because they know where it is, they know it's on the water and they can allocate that particular furniture to whoever the individual is. So again, the whole idea with real-time visibility is to provide earlier uh, warning. So when you look at some of the information you get, I'm just gonna show you some high level examples. Certainly you get dots on a map, just like you would with your Uber Eats, where's the truck, uh, where's the driver. As something is moving across here or across Europe or across the, the ocean. And you'll see on the left side, you get updates, which are the latitude longitude feeds that are coming in uh, every uh, 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes or so as something crosses the, uh, the US. But the valuable information is down below. You'll see orders and inventory. You can go into an order. You can click on inventory and see where the items are. Because if I'm a buyer, a planner, or uh, you know, in charge of production, I need to know where are those parts. Uh, you've probably heard about the chip shortages that are going on now that are causing problems across many industries, including the auto industry. So this is becoming very valuable. The information, not these dots on the map, but rather what's in that shipment and where is it and when will it be here? Uh, Geofencing is another new technology that's being used uh, uh, in this whole real-time visibility arena and that you can, this is a radius example, but you could do it from a time basis and say, tell me when something is uh, uh, one hour away from Fort Myers so that I can free up the docks and have people ready to unload that truck and, and move it right away to wherever it's going or put that to get that uh, uh, cross docket or get that uh, inventory put away. Uh, it enables us to also, uh, and the customer, identify when something is delivered or picked up because when it crosses the geofence, and you can get very specific, you can have it right down to the facility in Ave Maria or wherever it might be, so you can see exactly when something enters or departs the location, and which can also, with the timestamps and that critical data, can be used to uh, offset any fines and penalties that somebody said, well, you delivered late. Well, no, we didn't. Here's the information exactly of when the truck was there and when it left. 
So um, when you drill down even further, uh, you can see things like uh, right at the top, you'll see a uh, metric ton. So uh, sustainability is very important to us and to our customers. And as many of them are using this data to see the uh, metric ton carbon to uh, carbon emission situation on every shipment anywhere in the world. But then you can also see exceptions like this shipment's running late. These ETAs are updated every 10 to 15 minutes with the new information. Again, you know, running that up against weather and traffic and things of those nature. And if you're in cold chain, then you'll actually even, as you see here, get temperature readings, which are again, very important for uh, our pharmaceutical type customers. If it was uh, someone like Inovo with um, high uh, server racks, uh, high, high, high value equipment, there's tip and tail information uh, that we would get as well. So there's many, we're not a sensor company. We integrate with any sensor company, Sensatec, Rombi, whoever they might be using to get those feeds. So you're not only getting a feed from the asset, where's the truck, you're getting a feed from the actual product. Some companies actually have sensors on their products. If you're talking about a Boeing aircraft engine or a Caterpillar uh, you know, tractor, we can actually get the feeds from the equipment. Um, again, I'm gonna try and end in half an hour and then take Q&A. So I'm sorry, if we took questions out, we would probably go two hours. So. Uh, Suez Canal conundrum, uh, there's a disruption that happens every day. I mean, all we have to do is to look at this week with the Continental Pipeline. Uh, we all live in Florida. We pray to God there's no hurricane disruption this summer. Uh, but there's, you know, right now there's disruptions in Singapore, Long Beach, California, uh, Montreal. There's delays everywhere. When the Suez Canal hit, uh, we were able to go in and tell our customers exactly where every ship was, where their containers were, where those orders were. Some of them then could make uh, additional requirements and, and go around the, you know, go around Cape, go around Cape Horn, go around South Africa, uh, and move cargo up there or fly it. Uh, so it's getting that information right away so that you can take. Uh, we call it incident management. We have uh, as incidents happen, we have people that follow incidents. Uh, they are reported and then people are made aware of it so that you can take action. Now, a lot of this, and I'll be talking about it. Uh, is it's great for early warning, but it's better if it's integrated into other workflows in your company, in your uh, SNOP planning and, and other planning and rapid response and things of that nature, manufacturing systems. Um, so this is good standalone information, but it's even more valuable if it's put into other systems of record you may be using in your organizations. This is just showing uh, Long Beach um, where there's many ships sitting out there. This is, this is an old- Pardon me? Anybody else having trouble hearing me? I think somebody's uh, Siri got set off there, so. We can oh. hear you, John. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you fine, John, you're good. Oh, I'm sorry, okay, apologize. Um, so the, um, this we give an update basically every day to our clients on where things are. Uh, and you can see the dwell time here is uh, port dwell time in Long Beach is eight days. The vessel is 4.5 days. That means it sits out in the water at anchor for almost five days before it even gets into the port to be unloaded. And it's another 8.3 days to be unloaded and out the gate. So you're losing about 12 days. Um, so customers have to build that into their lead times because before, if they had a lead time of 30 days or 40 days, they better be adjusting it, you know, out to uh, by another 12 days at least. So this is updated every single day. Further to that, we run reports, dwell time reports globally. So people can look at exports and imports around the world and say, geez, Long Beach is the worst in the world right now at about whatever that is, about 10 days or so there. Maybe we ought to sh uh, move that cargo over to Norfolk where there's only a couple of day delay. And the same thing as you look around the world. So they're using this information as they look at uh, moving product around the world and how they can get it to, to their customers faster. This predictive ETAs, as I mentioned, is a complex science. Uh, domestically, we have different algorithms that do internationally. And internationally, we have a lot of historical data on ocean routes over the last 12 years due to uh, acquisition that we made in Europe. But you also have weather, traffic, construction. <laughs> we get updates on how the ships are sailing if they have to make a diversion, you know, due to a typhoon or something of that nature. That's all calculated then into the predictive ETAs. This is just an example of a shipment coming from Asia, going to Mexico, then down to Peru, Bolivia, Argentina. We're already predicting while it's 
down in Mexico, it's going to be three days late getting into Argentina. Uh, and so the carrier themselves, the actual carrier that's carrying it said it was going to get there 913. We're already predicting it's 917 because we have actually better data than they do because we're getting data. We have all the historical data. We know what's happening on the ground. We know what's happening in each congested port. We know delays are going to hit in Peru and Bolivia. And so that information is used by our customers as they are uh, moving goods around the world. So the accurate ETAs um, are really key. They're getting better all the time. Uh, if we looked at this number a couple of years ago, it was like 70 some percent, wasn't very good. But again, the models are learning. We're getting more and more information. Uh, we're getting better, better clean information from, uh, from the carriers. Uh, we're normalizing it. It's, it's just getting better all the time. Uh, and then the margin of error is a lot better. Now think about it, if you're running a distribution center uh, and you're expecting some hot shipments to come in, you really need to know when, when they're coming. And, and a lot of our customers use this to plan labor at the distribution centers, um, minimize overtime and other labor costs. And of course, big thing, turn the, receive the cargo and turn it quicker. Uh, one of the things that all the carriers look at as Ian can attest to is a shipper of choice. So you certainly wanna be somebody who doesn't keep the, the carrier's assets, their vehicles, their trailers, sitting around, you know, waiting two hours to be unloaded, two hours uh, you know, for a pickup. Uh, you wanna get in and out quickly at your facility. And those shippers are the ones that are getting capacity and even better rates. So that, that's a very important uh, aspect of it. Uh, if you're at a store level, a lot of our retail accounts, you know, Dollar General Tractor Supply, they may call people in early in the morning to uh, load the shelves, right? Well, they certainly would not like to call them in at six in the morning on overtime uh, if the truck is not gonna get there till 10. So we're able to tell them ahead of time, hey, don't call them in early. Here's, here's when the truck's gonna get there. It's not gonna be there till 10. So uh, there's things like hours of service and the hours of operation of each facility built into the system. So they know if somebody closes their docks at 5 p.m., that shipment's not gonna get there till seven. It's not gonna be delivered today and it sends out automatic alerts. And what's great about all of it, it's, it's uh, no human intervention. It's all machine enabled. So I mentioned earlier about sending this information to other systems of record. Here's an example of EverStream uh, Analytics, which was formerly uh, DHL Resilience 360. That's why you see the DHL trucks and planes on there. But they are a risk management system that looks at many, many aspects besides just transportation. So they're looking at geopolitical risk, country risk, financial risks, uh, the actual vendor financials, and many other things that are very important to uh, global supply chains. So what they offer is far more robust than what I'm talking about, but yet the actual visibility, the transportation visibility is very important aspect of the total um, uh, you know, solution that they bring to those customers. So this is why I was saying that that uh, real-time visibility data can be used by many different parts of the organization, repurposed for different uses and used by other systems. And again, a machine to machine uh, without anybody having to uh, do any more data entry and have uh, quality errors. So that's one example. Another example, Blue Yonder used to be called JDA. Um, they have a Luminate control tower, which again, looks at the full supply chain aspects of a company that would involve production, manufacturing, sourcing, uh, customer service, uh, all sorts of things in the supply chain of which again, the transportation visibility is only one part of it, but we do feed that data to Blue Yonder to make their, their solution that much more powerful. Connexus, uh, another uh, rapid response uh, a provider that uh, enables companies to um, respond to things that are happening on a daily basis, let alone disruptions. Well, what was missing in their uh, whole solution was real-time visibility. They were doing things, again, based on historical information from, you know, six months or a year ago, which is, you know, static and, and really not applicable anymore. So with this real-time information, they can provide better, better responses uh, to their clients and better solutions for their planning. SAP, I know a lot of the companies out there use SAP. Their control tower is called Logistics Business Network. Again, does far more than what we're talking about here. Uh, they're bringing in information from many di different data sources, but this real-time visibility data is part of how they put the whole puzzle together. 
uh, I always say it, it is like a puzzle. You need a lot of different players to put it together. We're just one part of that puzzle. But this real-time data is available and it's very usable uh, by customers. <clears throat> Only got two more slides here. I'm a little, little behind, I apologize. Um, so when you look at visibility, I think it's very important uh, that you quantify what does it mean for our company? Uh, some companies may have this uh, totally wired together, uh, although I haven't found many, but uh, the point is, where is it going to drive value for your customers and your organization? Uh, these are some of the areas we've seen. Improved customer service, so customer experience, net promoter scores, uh, providing better information to their customers uh, on you know, shipment arrival and when shipments are gonna get there. Operational efficiency, we still have a lot of customers that have people running around doing firefighting. Uh, some of them, they call them expediters. Uh, and they're calling, uh, we call it uh, check calls or calling, running after pro numbers and where's the shipment and did they get the EDI message? And I mentioned the uh, labor efficiency at warehouses and at stores. And with better information, uh, we're seeing a lot of customers adjusting their safety stock and buffer stock uh, in SAP and other to really drive out inventory because with better reliability and better information, they don't need this just in case inventory that is put all the way through the through the supply chain. Uh, the ability to dispute uh, carrier uh, penalties and uh, other SLA, SLA problems uh, for late, late, uh, excuse me, late arrivals. Uh, decreased transportation costs. Uh, again, deten detention to merge costs. Excuse me. Too much talking here. <laughs> um, can be eliminated with better information. <clears throat> I know in our system, we have a last free day that advises the customer, hey, you're going to start paying fines if this isn't picked up and delivered today. And then a de decreasing overall transportation costs. But I, I think some of the big things are, you know, in addition, are some are very strategic. I mean, if you're in the medical field, you, you know, you're talking life and death. If there's a surgery, you need to have everything there for the surgery. If you're installing, like for Lenovo, a data center, everything has to be there when they install the data center and the crews are there. Um, you know, if the shipment is on, isn't on the shelf at a retailer when they're running the Father's Day sale, that's markdown, markdowns and lost sales. So uh, these are all things that are real uh, that that you can each company can can look at. So last slide. Um, so on this uh, journey, we're seeing companies move from this tactical to strategic, uh, moving across the organization and driving uh, responsibility and accountability up through the organization. Certainly, you can solve problems at the lower level here, just tracking and tracing, but then maybe you can improve uh, on time and full, then you can improve the uh, customer experience uh, all the way through the process, uh, decreasing inventory. So the data can be used more and more strategically as you move forward. Some customers are doing this in much shorter timeframes, uh, but we're seeing it's a journey. You can't do things overnight. We always recommend starting small, solve a problem where it is now and grow from there. But this real-time visibility back to what, what, what I was hope to get across today can really help the managing of disruptions and help you be more agile and resilient in serving your customers. So we can go to q and A. I about three minutes late and I apologize, but uh, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see people. Is that all right? Okay. Any questions out there? And this is this is Pete. I, I had a two-part question if I could ask you, sir. Uh, great, great walkthrough of your presentation. Thank you for your time and expertise today. Uh, related to the solutions that Project 44 offers, uh, can you can you share with us what a, what a what a typical lead time is, a project lead time is to deploy your API kind of uh, your API solutions? And then the second part of my question is, um, what is the financial transactional model. So if a company signs up with your firm, is there kind of a, a project fee, a flat fee, and then a transactional based fee? I'm just kind of curious what the commercial engagement model looks like, generally speaking. All right. Oh, okay. Um, thanks for putting me on the spot. Appreciate that. <laughs> no, come on. I'm, I'm, is, I'm not talking about the actual dollars. What I don't understand is the mechanics of, is there a, is there a fee based and then a transactional based component to the the yeah. trade. No, good. I was just kidding. I was kidding. Pete. Okay. okay. All right. So uh, you just need to send John a check regularly and he'll be fine. It, it does, <laughs> does sound like that. 
Not, no, not, I, I, it was a great walk through the examples you gave, John. I'm kind of curious as to how hard is it to deploy? So that's the yeah. lead time angle. And Got then what is, what is the trade relationship from a Project 44 business model to its clients look like? That, that's yeah. I, I good, never very, asked you. That. Very good question. So number one, if you remember, I was with UPS Supply Chain. So I was a 3PL for a long time. And um, uh, EDI projects to bring customers on board uh, took anywhere from six, nine months a year. In the API world, um, well, we have done things during COVID for FEMA in two to three hours. Um, normal would be four to six weeks. Uh, if it's a more complex project, like I just showed you with Starbucks, it might be um, you know eight to 12 weeks. Uh, we normally do things in, in smaller chunks though. So we don't recommend big bang. So you know, rolling out a North American LTL would just be a couple of weeks. Uh, truckload might be a couple of weeks after that. So it's, um, it, it's it's pretty it's pretty simple. Um, we have 500,000 carriers on a platform, so it's um, they're already connected. So it's just a matter of go, going through the testing and bringing it on board. From a commercial side, um, <clears throat> we go through a review with each customer. It's based on the uh, the different modes that they may, may want to track shipments. So how many ocean containers do you have a year? How many LTL shipments do you have a year? How many truckload shipments do you have a year? And then there is an agreed to price for the year. And it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's software as a service. It's either paid up front or paid quarterly. Most of the contracts are three to five years long. And that's no different if it's a shipper or a 3PL. We don't charge any carriers. We don't charge any of the technology uh, partners. Um, so that, that if that answers the question, that's a high level. It does. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Other questions? So, John, I had a question. And this is a more of an academic uh, perspective. We talked about control towers uh, and uh, the idea of uh, real-time visibility is predicated on how much information is shared by the various links in the supply chain. If you go to suppliers and the supplier suppliers. Uh, so do you see any obstacles there? Because the real-time uh, information is the key. Yeah, very good comment. So control towers are, I would be remiss if I, they're a work in progress. So there are some good ones out there, but you hit the nail on the head. It's only as good as the information that they're getting in looking at that complete end-to-end -end supply chain across again, let's say supplier manufacturing, uh, tier one, tier two, do they have the raw materials? Uh, if, it's, uh, if it's apparel, you know, what's happened with the uh, knitting and dyeing and the cut and sew. And so you need all that information in addition to the transportation information. Um, certainly, uh, Pete knows this, uh, uh, quite a few uh, 3PLs offer control towers. And what they basically do is throw people at it. So they'll say there's a control tower in Atlanta, and we got one in Frankfurt, and we got one in Singapore. And so those are people that are going on websites and getting information and entering information manually and trying to put together information to give you that control tower view. Um, that's really not that's not sustainable. Uh, you need what you said, you need a, a systemic machine to machine control tower that is getting real time information from different sources and then putting it all together and providing that uh, decision making information to people you know, that are, that are utilize, utilizing it. So I gave you some examples uh, with, um, you know, the, with the Ever, Everstream and, and uh, SAP Canaxis and uh, Blue Yonder that have started on that journey. And I think they, they've got a very, uh, good approach, but to your being totally honest and transparent, it's only as good as the information that that is fed into it. That's why they came to us to at least get the transportation information. Again, as I said, these are very robust solutions. We're not a control tower. That answer that, Dr. Raj? Yes, it did. Uh, and, and I guess uh, you'd also have to extend it to the other side uh, beyond transportation, the last mile part also. Uh, how much visibility do you have over there? In yeah, so that's yeah, so a very good question. So the, the <clears throat> our goal is to provide first mile to last mile visibility. We just entered into China, announced that last week. Um, at least that's the first mile for China. Um, talking to Australia and other countries right now. But the last mile here in the U.S., uh, let's, let's start there, um, is a very complex area of which many, many companies uh, are trying to solve. In fact, it's a CSCMP in Atlanta 
September 20th and 21st, I'm running the technology innovation track and we have a whole session that'll be Lenovo and uh, Office Depot, um, Gartner, excuse me, <clears throat> and OneRail. So we believe in open source. So we partner with many, many different technology companies because we know we're not the silver bullet. We're just part of the whole ecosystem. So uh, we found one company that we think is pretty good in this last mile and that's OneRail. And so we're working on some big projects with them right now at Pepsi and Dell and elsewhere on uh, providing that last mile. So they've built a network like ours, but just for last mile to get feeds from couriers uh, so that you would have that information on when something is delivered to your house or when it's going to be delivered to your house. So, uh, and then what we, what we we would have that information fed to our platform so that we could give a, a customer the full the full view of at least the transportation visibility process, you know, from purchase to pay, order to cash standpoint. So that honestly, last mile is going to be the last <laughs> the last element that is really finalized because uh, it's the most difficult there it is and uh, so yeah and you answered my questions because uh, this is what we discuss in our courses in our classes and uh, and i always uh, say the sticking point is the availability of real-time data yeah and where do you see is the use of analytics at this point because even with the availability of data like in your case in the transportation part of the integrated supply chain, you're starting to get some more visibility. So at this point, uh, what sort of analytics are you using in conjunction? Yeah, so with our clients, <clears throat> first of all, all the data that we have belongs to the customer. So if uh, Lenovo, we, we send them all the data. They actually, uh, they use uh, IBM Watson and they have a blockchain. So all of our data goes there. We have analytics. I didn't show any of that, but we have analytics that our customers are using to uh, carrier scorecards, uh, dwell time reports, uh, transit time reports, benchmark reports. Um, so they're using this data to improve their own process. I kind of alluded to it, the uh, shipper of choice. Uh, one of the reasons the customers use the dwell time report is they want to, if they have 10 locations around the US, they want to make sure all of them are turning uh, when someone comes for a pickup, they get them in and out right away because the carriers love that. Ian could talk to that, I'm sure, for, for hours. Um, it's, it's really important. So uh, that's how the analytics are being used by our customers uh, after the fact. So they're using the information real time to manage what's happening. But after the fact, then they're doing these, uh, using the analytics to improve their own internal processes or have uh, conversations and QBRs, uh, reviews with their partners to say, hey, this is unacceptable. You're at uh, 89% uh, on time, and uh, that's just not going to cut it. So we're not using analytics yet to make changes on the fly. Well, as I said, that's when, uh, <clears throat> well, they use, they use our analytics. So let's say they don't have all these other, the systems I mentioned. Normally, the data we're sending to uh, Canaxis and Everstream and, and uh, uh, SAP, uh, Blue Yonder, there, that creates workflows in there that things are being things are uh, you know, taking action. But a lot of customers don't have systems of that nature. So we have a visibility operations center that brings up exceptions every all the time. So they can see there's an exception and now they can take action, whatever that particular action is, whether it's uh, uh, you know, on, on the inbound side of uh, sourcing or if it's outbound to a customer. So it's not a perfectly um, integrated systemic solution yet. That's, I think that's where we're all going. That's what digital transformation is all about is to, um, in fact, if we had time, we went through every mode. The most automated mode is small package. And then the least automated mode is ocean freight and then truckload. So you have different levels of, of sophistication that exists there. There's still many, many, and uh, Ian could talk about it as to people still using uh, faxes and, and emails and, and uh, phone calls and, you know, and not using uh, technology to digitize and automate uh, these processes. Yeah, that's, that's where I guess we come in, John. I mean, uh, and I, just to say hi to everybody, I was kind of no video there for a second, but if I'm going to chat in on this, I guess that's where we come in from a, a freight and third party side. And uh, we just had a great example of this last night. We had a, an expedited shipment that was being tracked through the night that was on an outside provider. And 
realized that that truck was going to be two hours late and they were going to run out of hours. So that truck got diverted to our Indianapolis facility that's just north of Indy. Um, we transloaded that freight and had another truck sent in to recover that freight so it could make the delivery on time because the driver wasn't going to have hours and they were already behind. So things like that. Last week, we had an issue with a, a container that was um, not going to make a vessel due to the vessel having damage. And quite frankly, we were alerted <clears throat> that the steamship line said that the vessel was going to be in the port of New York, but our tracking was showing it in Freeport which is where that vessel is re was sent to be repaired, but their own software hadn't actually updated the tracking on that particular uh, vessel. So we rebooked that freight on another vessel, um, had to pull it out of that yard, re strip that container, put it on another container that was going to be able to move on that mm -hmm. vessel line and rebook it. But those are the kind of things that ultimately, yeah. if you're a large enough, sophisticated enough customer, you may have a team doing that. Otherwise, that's where 3PLs like us um, are leveraging that technology and that visibility to help make those decisions, in some cases, on behalf of our customer before it happens. Because, of course, the vast majority of freight moves relatively um, without incident, picks up when it's supposed to, delivers when it's supposed to, it's that maybe 30% of the freight that, you know, we all talk about the headaches that it brings, but that's really what we're trying to deal with and get in front of. And that's, you know, where this technology helps us get in front of that versus responding to it a week later kind of thing. Yeah, those are those are great examples. And, and that's the, the kind of real-time visibility I know we provide to uh, our customers and 3PLs. And uh, I guarantee you, we, we would have told you that ship was in Freeport too. The carriers. Uh, I have that, no doubt, John. I know we, you got it. Yeah, we 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 uh, just you know we create sailing schedules that are better than the steamship line sailing schedules, and we have customers around the world that pay us for our sailing schedules. So uh, it's amazing to me that the the steamship lines. Uh, you can't imagine this. I you know you, if United puts out and says there's a flight you know leaving Fort Myers at 10 o'clock, you think there'd be a flight there, right? Well, the ocean carriers put out these sailing schedules and they have no intention uh, that they're going to make that sailing schedule. So we, we've had to update all of them. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Yeah. We, we were getting that data was from the steamship line and it was wrong. Their own data was wrong on that beacon. We got that data because we had other freight on that vessel coming in from Europe. So that's how yeah. we recognize yeah. that. And unfortunately, yeah, that's, those are some of the limitations, but those those types of issues where even the steamship lines have bad data on, that they're putting out through their own connections um, has gotten better, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. And John John probably sees these on a on a daily basis with these types of deals. So well, we have a whole team that that works on that in Hamburg, Germany. So, uh, but uh, anyway, that that was a great example of how you can use real-time visibility to solve issues on the, the expedited cargo and then the rebooking that ship. Those are great, thank you. We kind of ran over, is there uh, any other questions? I didn't mean to dig into everybody's day, but I hope you got at least one good idea out of this. I can tell you, John, I got some good ideas as to what I discussed in class uh, because you've given me a state of the art as being implemented in industry now because I can talk ahead of that, but it gives me an anchor. Well, good. Well, I, I really appreciate everybody's time. I hope you, you got something out of this and any questions, let me know. I do have the Transportation Vis Visibility for Dummies book that they wrote for me. Uh, if anybody wants one, let me know and I'll send it to you. So I gave it to most of the students when I was in teaching the class, but. Oh, great job. Thank you for your time. Thanks, 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 John. John. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, good job. Thank you.